Since we're running a little bit late while, you, uh, while we're having lunch, let me introduce Senator Kurt Schaefer, a good friend, and a, uh, he's really a great advocate for uh, Boone County, 19th district that he's in, and I think it's uh, Cooper County, isn't it, Senator? And um, Kurt is the head of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, and for those of you who may not know what that means, he controls the budget for the University of Missouri. Now, I'm going to make a little point here about being nice to Senator Schaefer. For those people of you who work at the University of Missouri, you have a president and a chancellor, and they don't mean squat. This guy does. They make the rules. He's got the money. So I'm going to make that point, because tonight the chancellor's going to be out at my house for reception. We're going to put the whoop on him about, uh, well, we don't know what about, but anyway. Kurt, come on up. You, Kurt's a former U assistant United States attorney, which means he's prosecuted and put people in jail, which makes you always want to be nice to him. Um, he's been head of the, the chief counsel for the Department of Natural Resources and is, had, is a hell of a good litigator, a damn fine attorney, but he's currently the state senator in the district that includes the University of Missouri, and uh, he's going to visit with us. And... Um, I'm really proud to have you here, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead and eat. I, I know we're kind of pushed for time. I want to thank Jeff. You know, this is a good example of the type of public-private partnership with a public university like the University of Missouri, which we fund in the General Assembly, and entrepreneurs like Jeff uh, and Otto Malley's here, and people like that who contribute so much, for example, to the university because of what they were able to get from the university, and it's a great partnership. I do want to. I, I want to talk about the state budget. And uh, Kenneth left, I guess, and he'd be glad to know we do have term limits in the state of Missouri, and I cannot run for the Senate again, so that would probably make him happy. But I, I want to tie in on some of the things that he said, especially for the students in the room, about the long-term outlook of the economy and your ability to generate capital, whether you're in real estate or any other form of business. Because you know, I'm an environmental litigator, and why they let the environmental litigator write a $25 billion budget is beyond me, but that's where I find myself. But of all the things that I worry about when I go to bed at night, and I have three young kids, the thing that I worry about most is the national economy. I think the greatest threat to national security right now is the state of the national economy. I think that things are creating a great deal of stress and anxiety individually on citizens is the national economy. So I want to talk about how the state budget is developed and how that relates to the federal budget and, and how that impacts you, especially as students, what your wealth generating ability is and the debt that you are going to take on because of people older than you who are right now spending money that you are going to spend your entire lives paying off. So let's talk about that first. In the Appropriations Committee, we write the budget on the Senate side of the building. And for those of you that don't know, you go back to your, your grade school civics class, you got three branches of government. Well, two branches are involved in the state budget, the executive branch and the legislative branch. And so in the state of Missouri, and it's somewhat analogous at the federal level, I'm going to talk about the state first. So we have a governor in the state of Missouri, and you have all those state agencies that are executive agencies under the governor. You have Department of Natural Resources, Department of Revenue, and all those agencies. All the money that we appropriate for anybody to spend in the state of Missouri, including for education, both K through 12 and higher ed, it all goes out through those agencies under the governor. And the governor appoints the directors, he sets the agenda for those agencies. And so what happens is, in the fall, the governor develops his budget for the upcoming budget year. And we go by fiscal year, not by calendar year, so our fiscal year starts July 1st. So the governor develops the budget, and if we ask the agencies what's in it, they won't tell us until the night the governor gives his state of the state address, which is usually the third week or second week in January, when the governor gives that speech, literally they are delivering those budget books to us. That is the first time we see it. And so this year's budget is just below $25 billion. The budget we're working on right now, which is the 2014 budget, which will start July 1st, is just over $25 billion. We get that delivered to us and we start going through it. Because we have to appropriate an amount of money for every line in every program that the state of Missouri spends. Nobody gets to spend anything in the state of Missouri through the state government unless we give them the authority to do it. So we get that budget, and the first thing that happens, it goes over to the House, and it gets put in 13 core bills, and it's by, co it's by content. House Bill 1 is public debt. House Bill 2 is K-12 through education. House Bill 3 is higher education, so on and so on. There's a House Budget Committee, 
That committee gets together. They look at what the governor wanted on every single one of those lines. They can agree with the governor. They can disagree with the governor. They do whatever they want on each one of those lines. They get done in that committee. They pass it out of committee. They take it to the House floor. They, who, the chairman, it's Rick Stream from St. Louis, who's the chairman of the House Budget Committee. He's got to pass those budget bills, all 13 of them on the floor. And sometimes you take some grief, and sometimes you fight off amendments, sometimes you take some amendments. When they get done with that whole process in the House, it then comes to me in the Senate. We get the budget last, and we have it for the shortest period of time. I've had it for, I guess, about three weeks now. And I'm going to pass it on the floor tonight when I go down there. We go into session at 4 o'clock. And, you know, it's taken me 45 minutes to pass that budget in the past. It's taken me 16 hours to, straight to pass it. We'll see what happens tonight. But when we get it, it comes to the committee. In my committee, we look at each line again. We look at what the governor wanted and what the governor did. We look at what the House did. We can agree with the governor. We can agree with the House. We can change it however we want it. Ultimately, we pass it out of committee, which is what we did last week. And then I take it to the floor, and I have to defend that budget on the floor. So that's how it works. Uh, the way the budget is designed, and just so everyone has an understanding, because I think a lot of times in the media you see Medicaid expansion, and you see tax credits, and you see all these things, and people don't really have a good idea of how those really fit into the budget. So one way to look at the state budget, that $25 billion, is to divide it roughly into thirds. And the first one-third is federal money that comes through us in the appropriations process, but we can't say where it goes, the feds say where it goes, and we can't change the amount. So think MoDOT, highway money, uh, certain Medicaid money, things like that. That's about the first one-third. It passes through us in the state general assembly. Remember, those agencies, whether it's DESE or whether it's Department of Mental Health, they can't spend it unless we give them the authority, but we can't change that first one-third. We either take it or we don't take it. The second third is money that comes in under state law for a specific purpose. So absent changing the law, we can't change where it goes. So for example, we have a Department of Insurance and Banking. And that, those industries are regulated almost entirely by fees that are put on the industry. So we have state laws. The money comes in on those fees. Again, that agency can't spend that money for enforcement and to carry out their purposes unless we give them the appropriation authority. But we can't change it, or we can't send it somewhere else absent some major change in the law. That's the second third. The last one-third is the most important part of the budget. And for the upcoming year, that's $7.5 billion. And we call that discretionary general revenue. That amount of money comes almost entirely from income tax, over 80% of it. The next largest amount is sales tax. There's a smattering of other taxes. But that's the money that is discretionary general revenue. And what it means is on an annual basis, I guess I can walk out here, because this, is this on? I don't like standing behind it. Which means on an annual basis, we can decide where that money goes. And we're supposed to do that, and that's pretty much how it was designed to work. And of that discretionary general revenue, a lot of it goes to public education, a lot of it goes to our Medicaid responsibilities. But what we find ourselves in 2013, and it's been happening for really the last decade especially, more and more of how we can spend that money is dictated by the federal government, and we have less and less to spend where we want. So of that $7.5 billion in the upcoming year of discretionary general revenue, which we're supposed to say where that money goes, just over $3 billion of that goes to our current Medicaid obligations. And so I'll, I'll just use Medicaid, and I don't really want to talk about Medicaid, but I'll use it as an example, because Medicaid expansion is something that the federal government wants us to do. Well, right now, there are 900,000 Missourians on Medicaid. And for every dollar that we spend on them, 40 cents comes from our discretionary general revenue, and 60 cents comes from the federal government. So another way to look at that is 40 cents comes from that last one-third, which otherwise we would have the discretion to spend somewhere else. And the 60 cents comes in the first one-third, which is the federal pass-through money. But in order to keep getting the 60 cents, we have to keep spending the 40 cents. So we really don't have any discretion. Either we're in or we're out. That's on the existing Medicaid population. Our expenses on the existing Medicaid population in the last four years have grown by $1.6 billion. Because Medicaid grows every year, and the same procedures get more expensive every year. Of that amount, $600 million of that was general revenue, discretionary general revenue. The rest of it was federal pass-through. But that brings me to what the other big chunk of money is in discretionary general revenue, and that is public education which is also just about $3 billion. 
And that includes K through 12. It includes the roughly 800 million that goes to higher ed, which is obviously much smaller than what K through 12 gets. But that's over 6 billion of the 7.5 billion right there. Prisons is about 750 million. Beyond that, there's a little bit left for a few other things. But you want to know where our money's going, our discretionary general revenue, your tax money, that's where it's going. It's going to those three things for the most part. Medicaid obligations already, it's going to public education, and it's going to prisons. And so that's why when you see things like, hey, let's just do Medicaid expansion. It's a great idea. It's the right thing to do. That's the governor's line. It's the right thing to do. It's a smart thing to do. But what I want everyone in the room to realize is there are trade-offs. Is it a good thing to give more people access to health care? Well, yeah, I think we'd all agree with that. But what are you trading off to do that? Because under the Affordable Care Act, where we're required, well, when they wrote the Affordable Care Act, all states were required to do the expansion. What no one anticipated was the US Supreme Court case last summer, where the Supreme Court said, no, federal government, you cannot make states do it. You have to give them the discretion which really threw a loop into the Affordable Care Act because now states had the decision whether or not they were going to do it, and that's where we find ourselves right now. But let's say that we do expansion. That's an additional three to 400,000 more people on Medicaid. And what the federal government says is, hey, it's good, though, because for the first three years, we're going to pay 100% of the cost, not for your existing population of 900,000, but for the new population of three to 400,000. We'll pay 100% of that. Does that sound like a good deal? If you need the care, it's a good deal. And I think if you're concerned, it's a good deal. But here's the thing. The federal government right now borrows 40 cents on every dollar that they spend. So the, the amount of borrowing that has to take place in order to do that expansion is tremendous. And that debt will continue to add to the $16.7 trillion deficit that we have right now which is absolutely unsustainable. You know, I've never met Warren Buffett, and I know that, that Jeff knows him, but I did see an interview with Warren Buffett a while back, and I'm a Republican, and I know Warren Buffett is on the other side of the fence, and he's an optimist. Much like Kenneth, he said he's an eternal optimist, but the one thing he did say was 16.7 trillion in debt, which right now represents about a little over 100% of GDP in the United States, is absolutely unsustainable. And every student in this room who wants to go into real estate or wants to go into any form of business has to understand what that means. It is unsustainable, and you will be paying that with the wealth that you generate for the rest of your life. And I agree with Kenneth when he says, we've got politicians, we've got to hold them accountable. Well, at the state level, for example, when we do that budget, we have a balanced budget amendment in the state of Missouri. We cannot spend more than we bring in. And the way we do that, because when we write that budget, we're projecting what's going to happen in a couple months. We have what's called the consensus revenue estimate. And the House and the Senate and the governor, and we all get together, and we do this in December, and we look at revenues, and we have economists that are very, very good at what they do, and they project what they think the growth will be, and we all agree on a number that we're going to budget to. And we pretty much get it right every year. The only year I'm aware of that we fell short was 2008, when the economy collapsed. And that couldn't, I think, been anticipated by anybody, but that's what we do. So when we look at that $7.5 billion of discretionary general revenue and we decide what we're going to spend on public education and on prisons and everything else, we only spend what we know we have. But the federal government does not work that way. They do not balance, and people don't believe this, they do not balance their budget. They pass the bills based on what they want to spend and then whatever comes in, they use that, and then they borrow the rest. That is no way to operate a business or to operate a government. You can't do that. It is generational robbing of the people who come after you who are going to have to pay that debt. The interesting thing is, you know, being at roughly 100%, a little over 100% of GDP on that national debt, up until a couple years ago, you couldn't find an economist anywhere in this country that would tell you that any society right now could go above 70% and ever recover from it. Well, we've crossed that line and we've gone past it. And people just stopped talking about it. It has to change. 
But it requires hard decisions. And, and I agree with Kenneth. It requires very hard decisions because you have to give things up. But let me give you an example. In 2008, 2009, when the economy tanked, we lost $1.6 billion of general revenue in the state of Missouri. 2008 was the high water mark, $8.6 billion in general revenue for the state of Missouri. And from 2008 to 2010, we dropped $1.6 billion. Just in the last two years alone, and remember, we've got to balance that budget. In the last two years alone, as the chairman of appropriations, I've had to cut $500 million out of the state budget two years in a row. And still fund education, still fund a lot of programs that are good programs that need funding. You know, got a lot of angry calls. The Columbia Tribune doesn't publish all the death threats against me. They did publish one last week. <laughs> but you know, those are the decisions that you have to make. But you have to have people in the right positions to make those decisions. And that's why as students, and, and, and I think one of the greatest things that Mr. Langdon said was, you have to have an open mind and you have to objectively evaluate the facts in front of you. Because whether it's business or whether it's politics and the state of our economy, you especially as students, and I'm addressing everybody, but especially younger people, you have to evaluate the facts of what's in front of you. To get on a political bandwagon and say, hey, come on, this is great, let's do it. The media loves it and everyone's saying this is the direction we should go. The first thing you should always ask yourselves, how much does it cost and how do we pay for it? But I want to give you a good example about, for example, a social program because we pay for a lot of things, as I said. If you're on Medicaid, we pay for every dollar of your health care. And so, you know, he mentioned smoker. If you're a smoker, if you're a woman who's pregnant and you smoke and you're on Medicaid and you have a premature baby, and a normal Medicaid baby is about $5,000, and a premature baby is at least $350,000, we're paying for it. If you smoke and you have a heart attack, we're paying for it. So we don't put any controls on that, but we make the decision that we're going to pay for those things because that's what we're going to do. But remember, simply taxing people more and taking more of their money or going more into debt is not the only way to do that. And I want to give you a good example because as we just saw on the video, low-income housing. The concept of low-income housing is really a concept that was championed by Ronald Reagan. And the idea was, with a growing social budget and not enough money to pay for programs, how can we partner with private business to make sure that business spends money on the areas that we want, on investment that we want, but maybe we can lessen the risk to get development in that area. Low-income housing is a good example. And the way tax credits, for example, for low-income housing developed were, rather than the state simply taking more and more general revenue and paying for more and more public housing, the concept was, why don't we give a tax break up front to those entities that are willing to build that kind of housing to offset the risk? And that's what we've done. And it's been a way that we've been able to curb some of the social spending. I mean, I'd like to see expansion of this concept in some other areas. But right now, tax credits are a very controversial issue for a whole host of reasons. But that idea of, of offsetting that risk. Because let me tell you, right now, if you're older and you're on Medicaid, let's say you have an option to go into a low-income housing project that was subsidized by tax credits. So it's a subsidized housing environment. It's based on your income and your net worth. And you can go into that environment and you can live on your own. For, it's pretty much pennies on the dollar for what we invest on that. The flip side is, if you have to go into a nursing home, cost for a Medicaid patient in a nursing home is about $150 a day. That's about $54,000 a year per individual. That is a lot of money when you add up the total population. Which is why we've done things like look at tax credits and put those out there to make sure that we're not shouldering all of that cost with general revenue. We're simply backstopping a little bit of the risk to get the investment to be made. Another good example is brownfield tax credits. Again, this is a program right now that a lot of people would like to get rid of. Brownfield tax credits have done a great job in the state of Missouri of making sure that areas, especially in St. Louis and Kansas City, where you've got traditionally contaminated property, which otherwise has an environmental risk, there's a liability, 
simply owning that property, no one's going to buy it, no one's going to redevelop it. So you just leave it and you move on to a green field, which is you know, somewhere 20 miles outside the city, but creates urban sprawl. We created the Brownfield uh, Tax Credit Program to, again, offset that risk for owners of that property or people who are willing to buy that property to clean it up, sometimes at great expense, but if you can offset that risk, then you've got a valuable piece of real estate. So right now, we've got a lot of people who are arguing against tax credits. We'll have this fight for the next four weeks left in the session. Because there's some people that don't want money spent on those purposes at all, but we are always going to spend money on a certain segment of the population that needs assistance, or we're going to spend money on a certain portion of the population where we want to direct investment. And I think tax credits are one of the best ways we can do that. Um, I tell you what, I'm going to have to go, but I want to take questions quickly. I know we're running a little bit late. I want everyone to understand, though, that that concept of how the, the budget works, the difference between the state and the federal government, and as you move forward, you should look at every social program that comes down the pipe, as well as every economic development program, with a very open mind of what do you get and what does it cost. Because I don't know, I mean, right now it's $16.7 trillion in debt. I don't know if we've ever had a generation that we will pass this much debt onto, especially for expansion of social programs. So I want to take some questions real quick before we go. Who's got a question? Come on, $25 billion state budget. Somebody's got to, somebody's got to have a question about what's in it. Yes, sir, back in the back. How much do you think, uh, oh, obviously it's quite a bit, but how much do you think the, uh, our state representatives helped him achieve that goal? I, look, when we pass it, I mean, the last four years, the, the question was, the governor likes to say he balanced the budget. The governor has given us at least three of the last four years a budget that was not balanced. But remember, that's just his recommendation. The rubber hits the road with what we actually put in the budget. We in the General Assembly balanced, have balanced that budget for the last four years in a row. We always have. And we will again uh, this year. The really interesting thing about that is when we, we go through every one of those lines and we assign an appropriation amount that that agency can spend, and that's true whether it's general revenue dollars or federal pass-through dollars, but the governor, the only line item veto authority the governor has is in the budget, those 13 budget bills. All the rest of the bills we send the governor, he's got to take or leave the whole bill, but except on the budget bills. He can go line by line and he can veto something that we put in a specific line. Now one thing that we've seen really interesting with, with Governor Nixon is when you veto something it gets a lot of media attention and then it comes back to the General Assembly and if you can get two-thirds vote in the Senate and the House you can override the veto. So what we've seen is this new development of something called a withhold or a restriction which really is a relatively new development. Um, you know the governor two years ago for example the university wanted to cut the university by seven percent and that's one of those years that we had to cut $500 million out of the budget. The governor didn't cut it. We had to cut it in the General Assembly, and we gave him back a balanced budget. We took that cut down to 5%. We gave the budget back to the governor, and he withheld to 8% for the university. So that concept of a withhold, it's really not anywhere in the Constitution in the process of budgeting, and it caused the auditor to sue the governor. Um, as a result of that, saying that's really not within your authority. If you don't like something, you've got to veto it or not, but you don't get this kind of you know, overall power to just not give the money that the General Assembly appropriated. That case is at the Missouri Supreme Court right now. Their hand-down days are on Tuesday. I don't know if tomorrow's a hand-down day or next Tuesday is. That decision should come out any day. I hope it comes out before we finalize the budget because I would like to know what the Supreme Court's position is on that. But um, that's a really interesting concept. But for the most part, we work together except for when the governor doesn't release money that we appropriate to things like higher education. Anybody else? Anyone else got a question about the budget? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a small gift for you if you'd like to unwrap I'm it. I'm going to open it right now. You're on a Mission to get to Jeff City. I am because it, we've, we've got to go in at uh, four o'clock, and I got to pass those budget bills. All right. These are a collection of CDs we put together for you. <laughs> yes.
your, your, your favorites. Yeah. So again, it's not a tombstone. I hope not. <laughs> it's an That's engraved nice. crystal. Thank you very much, Jeff. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Good luck today. Thank you. Thank you.